Good evening and welcome. My name is Paige Berger and I'm the marketing director here at Barrett Bookstore. I'm broadcasting to you live from Darien, Connecticut with my behind the scenes event coordinator extraordinaire, Rosanna Neeson and a distinguished panel of guests whom we will introduce in a moment. We're also thrilled to be here tonight in partnership with the Darien Library who helped to design and secure this event. To that end, I'd like to turn it over to my friend Kathleen Millard, who works in adult author programming at Darien Library. Hi, Kathleen. Hey, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. And on behalf of the Darien Library, we want to thank you all for coming. We want you to enjoy this terrific evening. You are in for a big treat. We also want to say, um, say a big thank you to the friends of the library, who without their support, these programs would be much more difficult, excuse me, would be much more difficult to provide. So with that, I will turn it over to Paige and you guys have a great night. Thanks, Kathleen. And thank you very much to the entire Darien Library community, to the board, to the staff, and to those of you who support their work. We're so grateful to partner with them on this event and events like it. So we have quite a crowd this evening. The numbers are continuing to climb, but not only do we have people here from Darien and Stanford and Norwalk and all the surrounding communities, but we have, re re uh, excuse me, we have people from Sydney, Australia and Tel Aviv and across the United States registered. So welcome to all of you. For those of you who are not familiar with Barrett Bookstore, we are located in Darien, Connecticut. We're in our 81st year of business, and we are here because of the community that supports our work as a local independent bookstore. We're so grateful to all of you who have ensured our success thus far and are helping to make sure that we stick around for many years to come. Before moving on to introductions, um, I do want to note that the reason we're gathered here tonight is that two of the three chefs have brand new cookbooks that they are promoting. And those cookbooks are available on our website and you can click right beneath my picture and purchase them very easily. So for you are attending a free event and they've worked really hard on these. This is Kid in the Kitchen by Melissa Clark, just came out on the 10th. This is a book, uh, Dinner in French, that Melissa put out in March, right as we went into lockdown. And Jacques Pepin's new book, Quick and Simple. We also have Deb Perlman's two wonderful Smitten Kitchen cookbooks available. So please go ahead and click on the link below if you're interested in purchasing them. And finally, for those of you who are not familiar with Crowdcast, this is a webinar platform. We can't see you, but we have a lively chat going on on that side of the screen. And there's also a button at the bottom where you can ask a question. So we're gonna have time at the end. We'll leave about 15 minutes for questions. And if you have anything you would like to ask our distinguished guests, you can go ahead and start putting your questions in there. And now I am very thrilled to invite our three chefs onto the screen via the magic of technology. We have Melissa Clark, and Deb Perelman and the legendary Jacques Pepin. <laughs> Here. I'm gonna take a moment for those of you who may not know them to give a brief introduction and then we're gonna get into conversation. So Melissa Clark is the author of the two wonderful cookbooks that I just showed to you. She is a staff reporter for the New York Times food section where she writes the popular column, A Good Appetite, and appears in a weekly cooking video series. She's published nearly 40 cookbooks, including two in 2020, Dinner in French and Kid in the Kitchen. Jacques Pepin is the winner of 16 James Beard Awards and a Daytime Emmy Lifetime Achievement Award. He is the author of 29 cookbooks, including A Grandfather's Lessons, Jacques Pepin, Heart and Soul in the Kitchen, and Essential Pepin. He has starred in 12 acclaimed PBS cooking series and was awarded France's highest distinction, the Legion of Honor. Pepin will be featuring his newest cookbook, Quick and Simple, tonight. Finally, Deb Perlman is a food writer, a home cook, a photographer, and a publisher behind the wildly popular Smitten Kitchen food blog. Winner of the best cooking blog in 2011, it has amassed a huge following. Note, Deb, I think as soon as you purchase, or excuse me, posted about this event, talk about a huge following. Our numbers went <laughs> through the roof. Um, she's written two New York Times best-selling cookbooks and is currently working on her third. 
She's written for Bon Appetit, Martha Stewart Living, Parenting, and NPR. Welcome to you all. So to kick off this evening, we're in a moment, and it's a moment that's lasted longer than any of us perhaps anticipated. At this point in time, what is your pandemic cooking dinner routine looking like? Melissa, I'd love to start with you. You know, it's it's been... Um... I have to say, this is the first time in my life I'm actually getting a little sick of cooking. I didn't think it would ever happen. I mean, I, love, I, I cook all day. I develop recipes all day. And then when it comes to dinner, I'm so excited to make to cook again, to make dinner. I love it. Every night, it's like I, I call cooking dinner my daily equivalent of the weekend. You know, it's like this calming ritual in my house. Of course, I'm drinking wine when I'm doing it. So it's like, <laughs> um, but after doing it, you know, three meals a day, for my family. And then also sometimes I have to make more than three meals because I want to eat something and my kid doesn't want to eat that. And my husband doesn't want to eat. And then it's just like, so it's more than three meals a day for months. I, I finally, the other day I was like, you know what? I think I might be, I, need, I think I might be getting burning out. So, so my pandemic cooking has been up and down. It's, you know, at times I've been excited about it. Like I always am. But at this moment, like today, right now, I'm just like, oh my God, just give me takeout. So, and I, we don't do a lot, of takeout, but we are, we are here. We are a takeout city. We're ready. So um, I don't know. That might not be the inspiring answer you want, but it's very honest. <laughs> we're, we're into honesty tonight. People, you know, we're eight months into this. People are all about honesty, I think. Jacques, what about you? How has the pandemic impacted your dinner routine? I've been married 54 years, you know, so... <laughs> And for 54 years, Gloria and I sit down at night to share a bottle of wine, sometimes two, and uh, <laughs> I cook. I go to the market. I go to the, well, we have the garden now, and of course, and uh, or farm and so forth. So it really hasn't changed that much because this is what we do. I mean, the cooking at night is the... Uh, the culmination of the day, you know, I mean, it's uh, the end of the day that we've done that for over half a century and so forth. And uh, the only thing that I missed, I mean, I'm going back to the market a little bit now, even though now in the last week, I may not. But uh, prior to that, uh, uh, my daughter was there or a friend going to the market with me. I would miss that because when I go to the market, I like to look at the food. I like to smell the food. I like to touch it. I like to, so, you know, even if some people buy it for me, uh, it's never exactly the way I wanted it. But uh, otherwise, frankly, we've been cooking basically the same way. And uh, I'm old now, so and my wife too. So we go more to our soup and something simpler. And we still do that, you know. So uh, it has changed in some way, but not that much. Thank you. Deb, what's dinner time in your house <laughs> like these days, seven, eight months in? Um, you know, sometimes I feel like the quarantine cooking has been the best thing. Sometimes I'm just reminded of all these like really simple techniques I have that I sometimes decide are like not interesting enough or like aren't going to, you know, be, you know, you know that exciting on the web where there's so many versions of these. And it's been kind of fun to get back to a lot of the basics, just the things that we could make for lunch that don't take that much time. Um, but there are other days and I would say like, this is probably like not my strongest cooking dinner week. And I think that usually happens when there's other stuff going on where I'm thinking a lot about Thanksgiving next week and the kind of stuff I wanna prepare. So in addition to recipes I'm developing for my site and my book and three meals a day, <laughs> lunches, snacks, to also um, be thinking about a separate dinner, sometimes a lot when there's other things in the plate. But for a lot of the pandemic, it's been kind of fun to sort of draw out old classics and say, wait, when did we stop making this? Like, why did we stop making this for lunch? We love this. So when it's good, it's very good. Melissa, you, you mentioned takeout, which I think all of us are appreciating a break now and then. What do you prefer to take out and what takeout should people be making at home? Is there something that people take out and you think, no, you can make that. Oh, hold on, Melissa, you're muted. There you go. I got you back. Hold on. Let's see. Oh. oh Melissa. <laughs> 
Oh, Melissa, I asked you a question and now for some reason I can't unmute you. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, I'm gonna pitch that question over and work on your volume. Deb, Jacques, what should people be cooking instead of taking out? And conversely, what do you only do take out? Well, you know, take out for me is always either Chinese or Vietnamese or stuff like that, different restaurants we have in the area. Otherwise, uh, you know, my wife was born in New York City, but from a Puerto Rican mother and a Cuban father. So we eat a lot of different types of things from uh, arroz con pollo, you know, or uh, mm. to, to Chinese to whatever. So we cook at home very often, you know, in the morning when she had her coffee and she doesn't like to talk and I don't talk too much during my coffee. <laughs> we usually get up at the crack of nine. So we are not very early riser. And I said, what do you want to eat for dinner? She said, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so, but <laughs> really, talk about it. She said, oh, I'd like Chinese too. So I go out to get Chinese. Otherwise, you know, I cook. I have so much stuff in my freezer, in my refrigerator, in the, so that I never have any problem to, uh, to cook. But basically, yes, yeah, we go occasionally she wants Vietnamese or Chinese or, or sushi. She loves sushi too, which I do, but sometimes she likes it better when I get it outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jeff, what about you? Favorite takeout or things that you encourage people to try making at home as we head into another maybe long winter where you can do projects? <laughs> I feel like whatever for takeout, first of all, it, a lot of times these days it comes down to restaurants we want to support. Like we love this restaurant. I hope it survives the winter. Is there something I can pick up there on a regular basis? So that's the, that's, become the first thing. But the second thing is I just feel like whatever you don't feel like making that somebody else makes really well is a really good thing to pick up. Save your energies for the stuff you feel strongly about or that you feel like you can do a good job on or that you want to tackle yourself. I um, I feel like, you know, somebody makes a really amazing wonton soup and I can pick it up and it's hot and perfect on a cold day like this. I'm very happy to eat it. Excellent. Melissa, can we hear you now? I don't know. Can you Hi. Guys, this is a, this is reality, and we're you know we don't have professional editors. Um, I'm just going to give Melissa a quick tech tip. Um, if you are open in two browsers, that can be a problem. If you're not using Chrome, oh, I hear you now. I'm using Chrome. Yeah, that's nice. Oh yeah. So, I'm going to have you um, log out and I'm going to invite you back up on screen in a moment. OK, so, um, you know, people, this is tech and we're going to pose the next question while Melissa takes a quick break and comes back up. OK, uh, so following up on the pandemic cooking, if you could tell people to stock up on something as we perhaps head back into a long winter and it cannot be beans or paper towels. <laughs> ingredient people are missing right now you have to, you're taking to me yeah. me yes go for okay, it all right okay well potato rice uh, uh certainly uh, even tomato i i buy tomato at the market hard and i keep them i keep them like for a week and a half before they arrive you know from, from banana to, to tomato, to potato, to rice, to, there is many, many things that you can buy and keep them for, for a long time. And I'm not talking about anchovy and sardine and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, tuna, tuna, all kind of can that I have and, and, and tomato, you know, can of tomato too and dry pasta. I mean, you can cook forever with any of this, you know, so yeah. Wonderful suggestions. Thank you. Deb, anything we're missing? You know, I started putting more stuff in the freezer. I do have a small apartment freezer, so there's not, it's kind of like when you open it these days, you have to duck because you don't know what's going to fall out. But I, you know, I, for example, I put wonton wrappers in there. I put um, extra nuts and seeds that'll go around so quickly. We buy extra coffee these days so we don't run out because it's very important for our morning routine. 
Um, I also started buying ground meat more, which was something I didn't use a ton of before, but I found that it's something that I can actually defrost pretty quickly um, if we decide we want to make something with it. And I feel like, I don't know, maybe that's just the way I cook, but the, I feel like ground meat in a way almost lends itself more to, to like a meat on the side kind of diet. Like if you're trying not to eat too much, I feel like you can really stretch a pound of it to like a nice saute or like mini meatballs in a way that like you don't feel like you're not eating a ton of meat. We're not huge meat eaters just to begin with, but it's become a way that we can make sure we have really good quality stuff. But, you know, we don't have to decide a whole day before when we're going to use it. Great tips. Thank you. All right, well, let's, uh, let's try again. Okay. How's that? I figured out, I think I switched mics somehow there were, anyway, um, what was, what was the question? Okay. I, was so nervous doing that. I wasn't listening. <laughs> the question was, um, as we perhaps head back into a little bit of stocking up mode, mm -hmm. what are you encouraging people to have? And the answer cannot be beans or paper towels or toilet paper for that matter. <laughs> Um, did we talk about condiments? Did you guys talk about how you have to stock up on, co okay, condiments, because, you know, that is what I've been doing a lot is I'll make the same, you know, the same roast chicken or the same sheet pan chicken, and I'm just mixing up the condiments. So that's a way for me to cook something quickly because I'm confident in the recipe, like sheet pan chicken, right? Chicken parts, chicken mm -hmm. thighs, especially olive oil, salt, pepper on a sheet pan in the oven is one of the easiest things you can make for dinner. Everyone loves it. And by changing up the condiments, I get a whole new dish. So I would say now is your time to go out there and buy things that maybe you don't have. Like, do you have um, all the different chili pastes that are available? You know, do you have um, <laughs> Korean chili paste? Do you have Szechuan chili paste? Do you have harissa? Do you have, you know, um, what are, what about different sesame sauces? Do you have different kinds of tahini to make dressings? So stock up on that now. And that way, even if you're starting to get a little bit you know, burnt out with cooking, for example, um, you can bring yourself back in by trying, you'll have things to make it new. These are all That's such a good, good suggestions. Can I put that in my recipe? <laughs> of course, John, <laughs> anything for you. <laughs> yes. I hope people are taking notes and if you want to drop a list off at Barrett Bookstore tomorrow, I would appreciate that. <laughs> all right, so we're talking new cookbooks tonight too. And I'm going to start with Jacques. You have this beautiful new cookbook that Dwight Gardner did a review of earlier this week in the New York Times. And if you all have not read that review, it was um, it just made me so happy and it made me thrilled to have this book in my hands. Jacques, can you talk with our audience here about what might be different about this work versus other cookbooks that they have of yours? You know, I've done 30, I think 31 cookbook now. So uh, very often because I did 13, 13 series on television, fast food my way or one thing or another. So I try to put my knowledge of food specifically in an area too. In fact, in the 80s, I did a column in the New York Times for about 10 years called The Purposeful Cook, which was to cook for a minimal amount of money for a family of six. So I did a book called uh, The Cuisine economic, it was called the Purple Food Cook. Then I did a book for the, the Cleveland Clinic for weight loss, so it was very specific. Then, then of course, maybe what I'm known the most, maybe the book of La Technique, La Method, and those are illustrated manual of cooking technique, where I actually went into Long Island Sound to, to catch a, 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 a skate because I wanted to show oh. you how to take the wing out of the skate, but I couldn't get a whole wing. I, I could a whole skate. I could only get the wing. Then I, I went into my pond to get to get frog to show you how to take the skin because I couldn't buy them with the skin. So you know, those will be totally different from that book to to a fast food my way or, or uh, when I did fast food my way, I did two series on, on television. I used to buy the package from the supermarket and bringing them on the stage, and in thirty minutes I did three or four dish just with the. Uh, out of those, those package, I, I, I use, actually what I did. I use uh, the supermarket as a prep cook. You know, when you're in a restaurant, you have a prep cook who come in the morning. He bone out the chicken, he cut out the fish, slice the mushroom, chop the shallots, and so. So, but what, by the time I get to the stove, someone order a, a fill of salt. I have it there. I have some shallot, I have some 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 uh, some uh, mushroom, a bit of white wine. One two minutes, cook it, finish it with cream. I do the dish in five minutes because. The prep cook is there. So I use the supermarket this way in those shows. You know, I have skinless, boneless, 
breast of chicken, I have pre-washed spinach, I have a pre-sliced mushroom at the moment, I have an off-stick pan, so I can do a dish in like five, six minutes, you know, using that type of thing. So that, what was your question anyway? <laughs> <laughs> no, you just keep talking. I am like totally. Yeah. Really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the question I, was about your beautiful. Oh, yeah. so, so, so so I, I, I didn't. I didn't that. plan to do that book for the pandemic. I started that book a couple of years ago. It's just coincidental, you know. And I do those show for my daughter Claudine on, on Facebook, showing people how to use what you have in your refrigerator and your freezer in the pantry to make your life easier, you know? So that's basically the idea, you know? Perfect for right now, truly. Melissa also has a brand new book. She has two books this year, but this one, which I tried to wrap for my kid in the kitchen. And then I was preparing for this panel and he walked into my office and grabbed it off my desk and started paging through and said, I want to make this and this and this. So <laughs> it's very appealing tested, but by a 10 year old around here. Melissa, tell us about this book. You've written so many. Is this your first kids cookbook? Yeah, it is. And um, it was so it was so fun to write because, you know, my daughter's 12 and she was never interested in cooking before. I mean, I can which I can understand. I mean, I didn't give her a lot of space in the kitchen. You know, I'm con I'm always in there. Um, and so but what I realized is that if I if I actually get out of the kitchen and just let her do her thing, she is so engaged and she loves it, but she needs a little bit of instruction. You know, even though she watches me, she she needs some hand holding. And you can't just give her a recipe and expect her to do it. So what I did was I um, you know, I and then you know, if I gave her a kid, like a little kid, there are a lot of little kids' cookbooks out for smaller kids. Mm -hmm. And that she felt like, oh, those are for babies, you know? So what I wanted to do is really get that sweet spot ages eight to 14, where they are there, they can make anything. Like they're very competent. If you show them how to some basic kitchen safety, you know, and you don't stray too far, you can pretty much trust them in the kitchen, but they also need a little handholding, a little more than an adult. So that's what I wanted to do with this book. And also, you know, put recipes in that kids would really like, you know, um, like, I mean, a lot of grain bowls, like my daughter loves like putting all different things together in a bowl and like and being creative. So showing them like, okay, well, these are, this is how you do that. You know, this is how you can, um, you know, make different things on your avocado toaster, your pizza and your ice cream sundae bars and, and let them really take the reins by showing them the basics. And it was so fun. And then what I did was I had her, all her friends help test the recipes. So, you know, she came and helped me come up with the list of, of um, recipes and then her friends helped test it. So it is kind of by, I mean, I wrote it, but I had a lot of help from, from the kids. And um, so I think, I mean, I think, I think the kids will like it. I don't know. We'll see. You know, it just came out. So I'm sort of waiting to hear, but I'm glad to hear that um, your, your kids are into it. So. Yes, definitely. And I love seeing your daughter in it. I think they I think they appreciate seeing their peers. Um, the mm -hmm. other book that Melissa put out this year, Melissa, I dare say you may be the only author who's had two virtual book tours during the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know, boom, boom. So you may be the expert in this area. This is Dinner in French, and it is a um, it is not a kid's kick cookbook, but it's very family oriented, I found. Can you talk a little bit about this for people who may have missed it? Because it was released right in mid-March when everything was a little crazy. Yeah, actually, the book party for Dinner in French was the last event I went to. That was it. We locked down the day after that. And um, so it was, I, I mean, it was good because I, I had this amazing thing that I did the night before. And then the next day it was like, oh, okay, well, Goodbye, everybody. Um, but that book is also a family book, but in a different way. That's reflective of my family and my growing up for me, I grew up um, and, you know, Jacques has heard this before, but I always like, I love to, you know, say it in front of him, but I learned how to cook in France. My parents were big. I mean, they, Jacques, my parents idolized you and Julia Child. They cooked everything that you did, but only in France because they were both, you know, working. I had two working parents. They're both psychiatrists. They worked all day and, and into the evening too, evening hours. So I really didn't see them a lot. And we certainly didn't cook together when I was home, but every August, because back in the 80s, psychiatrists took the whole month of August off. And we went to France for the whole month and we'd, you know, exchange our house. So we'd exchange our house in Brooklyn and, you know, we'd go stay in a little town in France and we would all cook together. And that was, so to me, family cooking is cooking French food, you know, preferably in France, but cooking French food and 
I wanted to share that experience. I mean, it's written for adults, but it's very much the food of my childhood. And I tried to make it accessible and I put my spin on it because, you know, I did grow up in Brooklyn and very practical. Um, so it's sort of France meets Brooklyn in a way. I'm sorry I ruined your life. <laughs> no, you didn't. Are you, are you kidding? I wouldn't, I would not be sitting here right now on a panel with you if it weren't for you. Oh boy. In many yeah. ways. So Deb also has two incredible cookbooks that are on constant rotation in my house. We're big fans of the everything cream cheese drop biscuits. I don't know if I got the title right, but those are those are favorites. So she has the Smitten Kitchen cookbook, and then she also has this wonderful Smitten Kitchen every day. All of these books are available on the website. Um, Deb, you're working on a third book. Can you give us any sneak peeks into that? <laughs> Um, uh, you know, title not really sorted yet, but I will say that I started thinking about this book in January of this year and I'd already done the proposal and everything was just finishing up the contract in March when all the publishers offices closed. That was fun trying to get a contract back and forth, but, um, it was basically right around then. And it, it, it ends up being kind of timely because I ended up this, this idea that I'd been kicking around because I. I take a long, a long time to write books. So I've been already thinking about it for a year and I decided to like move forward with it in January. Anyway, um, the idea, I feel like it actually goes really well with the time we're in now. We're in it a little bit of what I said earlier where I realized that I have all these, um, not basics, but these forever recipes that I use that I don't necessarily like think of putting on the internet. Um, but that would, you know, it would be fine there, but I love the idea of kind of putting them together in a book, these idea of like your forever favorite recipes. And that's kind of the energy I had going into it. And then the pandemic hit, it really like helped me kind of double down on this idea. So it's been fun to work on this stuff um, because it's kind of just what we want to eat, which is good because that's sort of like the goal of a cookbook, but it's also very much what we want to eat right now. So it's working well, you know, all three or four minutes a day, I get to work yeah. without anybody interrupting <laughs> during homeschooling. Homeschooling, cooking, working. It's a, it's a piece of cake. Yeah, everyone All on right. top of each other. In the <laughs> well, let's talk about cooking with kids because obviously that's the topic of Melissa's book, but all of you have extensive experience, whether with your own children or Jacques, you have that wonderful cookbook you put out with your granddaughter um, and what is tell us about the biggest joy in cooking with kids or your own kids in the kitchen and also what's the biggest challenge well when claudine my daughter she's over 50 now but when she was a year two years old i used to hold her in my home you know i cooking upset new york we had a house in the Catskill in the ski area and uh, when i cooked there I hold her in my arm and I say, okay, and I melange, melange. So she stirred it, you know. She stirred it so she could made it because she made it with that so she was going to eat it. So, you know, you got to get the kid involved. I mean, there is no place like the kitchen when kid come from school to sit down there and to hear the voice of your mother, the voice of your father, the, 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 the noise of the equipment in the kitchen, the smell of the food, the taste of the food. Those are very visceral, you know, remembrance that you stay with you the rest of your life. And when Claudine, when, when Shuri, my granddaughter was small, I put a little stool next to me at the stove. She's now taller than me anyway, but, uh, uh, and I said, okay, give me the, give me a fork, give me a spoon, give me that. Okay, you want to help me wash the lettuce? I said, I say, okay, give me some parsley. I said, no, that chive tested, no, that parsley. That's right, that's terrible. And then I, I take her to the market with me. I say, I need some pear. Do you think they are ripe? Did you smell them? And those tomatoes, you say. So, you know, she touched the food. She, she come back, sit next to me, hand me the food, go. And this establish a conversation, you know. And the conversation, of course, is important when you're cooking, but even more important when you're sitting down and eating. The conversation goes on and carry on and goes on to other subjects and all that. So for us, you know, this, the structure of the family is very much involved in that type of situation, you know, so that was very important. Yeah. Thank you. Now, what about you? What do you find the biggest joy in working with your kids and perhaps <laughs> anything that's a challenge? 
Um, I like cooking with the kids, though. I prefer it more on the weekends. Like, you know, this Monday nine to five thing, I try to like set that out for doing work cooking, which I don't think really goes very well with kids. I'm sorry to disappoint anyone. But, you know, like you think of being in like a cubicle in an office and like a kid sitting in that cubicle next to you and like how much work you get. To. But on the weekends, like making muffins, making biscuits, boring them with like conversations about like why you want to fold your biscuit to create layers and stuff. I'm sure they won't remember any of it, but maybe they'll pick up a piece or two. Um, I really, it's really fun. Uh, and I think the biggest challenge is mostly just that it takes so long. I think we people who cook all the time aren't, you know, we our whole days are based on like how much we can get through in a day. And that requires a certain level of speed and I'm already on the slow side. So, you know, realizing that like the kids want to help cook dinner, but that might mean that it's dinner tomorrow and not tonight um, can be a challenge because they'll get hungry. And then, you know, you have to go make peanut butter and jelly then. <laughs> which they're not really mad about. <laughs> no, probably not. Melissa, you said in the article that was in the Times today that we have to be willing to let the kids make a mess, right? Yeah. Is that, so it that, takes- Yeah, that's the hardest. Actually, that's the hardest thing for me is just like taking that deep breath. And um, I mean, now she's 12, so it's I, she, you know, she knows how to clean it up. So I, I have to remind her, it's not like she's gonna do it if I'm not there, like go get a cloth, clean that up off the floor, but she'll do it. But when she was littler, you know, that whole thing of making a mess, like that really stressed me out. I have to be honest about it. Be like, okay, yes, here's the flour. Go ahead and measure it, knowing that, you know. <laughs> but it's, I think it's worth it because, you know, she is, she's, all, she's only 12 and she's so much better. You know, and, and she gets where the mess is, and I never let her. I never let her off the hook. You know, my big thing, and it is harder. You know, it's funny. I remember reading this article in the Times. I can't remember who wrote it. It was a long time ago, and I remember reading it about parenting and um, about how it's so much easier to do it yourself, but then you teach your kids nothing, and they get nothing. You know, for everything. You know, like taking out the garbage, doing their laundry. You know, and same thing for me. The lessons are in the kitchen. The reward comes. It is extra work for you, a hundred percent. But it is a gift for them. And so I keep thinking to myself like, okay, I'm giving them a gift. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's hard, but it is so much easier now. Now I'm reaping the rewards of that gift that when, you know, she was like seven and eight and making a mess and now she's 12 and she's cleaning up that mess. And, you know, she's like loading the dishwasher in the way that I like her to wow. load. You know, it's, it's all. Wow. Um, yeah. So I, I, you training? I really stuck with it. I have to say it was hard. Um, and, but you know, the, but the um, other thing is it took a long time for her to get interested in cooking things that weren't sweets that she could stick her finger in the batter, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, she's there for the cookies and the brownies, but like now I've, now she makes a salad every night. She toss, makes a dressing, tosses a salad. Next step wow. is going to be washing the greens. So, you know, um, it's a challenge and enjoy at the same time. That's good. That's great. I'm inspired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm inspired too. I'm glad you know they move on from the just, you know, licking the brownie batter. Like, you know, I'll come home from work and my kids have made a million cookies, but salad isn't quite on the rotation no. yet. I mean, every single night I'm like, oh, yeah, come make the salad. Die every single night, you know, and she doesn't. Oh. Do or she doesn't get her right. life. She doesn't do it. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, it, is a, it is a different world because when I was 13, I was an apprentice. You know, I left home wow. in 1949. I was 13 years old to go into former apprenticeship. And home was actually a restaurant where my mother was the cook and my father was a cabinet maker. So since I was six, seven, you know, even coming back from school, my brother and I, you would never have told your parents, I am bored. My mother would say, you what? <laughs> <laughs> you have to the, the potato. With the Are you kidding? We try to hide. You know, when you come back from school. So, yes, there is nothing wrong about the kid, 10, 12, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, make them work and do. I mean, you know, we did that. I did that when I was an apprentice, killing chicken, <laughs> rabbit, and plucking them. So, yeah, that's uh, another world, you know. But it's good. It's good. The kid will appreciate it, you know. So, and it will remain with them the rest of their life. You know, I, I, I am. Mm -hmm eaten in so many three-star restaurants, extraordinary restaurants around the world. And if you ask me about the memory of meal that I had, probably the one that I had with my, my mother, my brother, my wife, uh, you know, so because 
the food is important, certainly, but the memory, the people you're with, and all that probably even more important. So uh, those tastes, uh, you know, I can't close my eyes and I know that's my mother's uh, chicken cream sauce. I mean, I can close my eyes and I know this is the lobster souffle of the Plaza Athene in Paris or the striped bass of the pavilion mm -hmm. when I worked there. We used not to have any recipe anyway. Uh, you know, you, you went by, by taste. You work in a place uh, so long and you, learn the recipe of that place and that what remained with you so the, those taste memory in the proustian style you know style. yeah that's wonderful thank you yeah okay question about feeding a family i think that's the title yeah that's the title of the family. feeding a family okay mm -hmm. you, you it's a long day you've gotten home you do not have the luxury of lots of time What's your quick go-to? People are hungry, kids are saying, what's for dinner? Any quick strategies you have or go-to meals? Those dinner are tacos. Those mm -hmm. are questions for those two beautiful women. For me, yeah, okay. all I have to do is my wife say, what do you want to eat? And I said so. <laughs> Jack, we all want to be living in your world right now with our wine. Mm -hmm. and so. Very much. <laughs> Pasta. Pasta. Pasta, right? I mean, we do. Okay, so our house pasta is pasta with um, garlicky breadcrumbs because you can make it with mm. nothing, and you put any vegetable with it. So you know, you make your pot, you boil your pasta at the same time. Um, we always have breadcrumbs. This is a good thing. To, I mean, you can use panko, you know, just buy panko. But we always mm -hmm. have, you know, my husband's baking a lot of bread these days, so we always have <laughs> really good bread. Yeah, but he started it before the pandemic, so I'd like to give him full credit for that. <laughs> Um, but so we, so we always have breadcrumbs. So you saute garlic in oil with breadcrumbs. And, um, I always slip some anchovy in there. My Dahlia never notices. She loves these breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. So lots of garlic, <laughs> breadcrumbs, all of, that's it, salt, red pepper flakes, and then, um, throw it on the pasta with butter, a squeeze of lemon, and then any vegetable goes with that. So you can saute kale, you could do, or you could just eat that. And it is so fast. It's like 20 minutes. You you need no ingredients. And the only, you don't even have to chop anything. All you have to do is grate, you know, press your garlic through a garlic presser, mince your garlic, or I usually just grate it. So that's it. I think chopping, if you can get a recipe with minimal chopping, you're good. <laughs> Thank you. Deb, did I hear you say tacos? Yes, we do tacos a lot, actually. It's not, we all, we also do pasta a lot, but I feel like because I have a five-year-old who only wants to eat pasta, like I'm just trying to, I'm always like, have, so um, I find that um, these are not the best brands of tortillas. I'm sorry to tell you that, but like they do keep in the fridge and the freezer, depending on what you buy. Um, always have a can of beans. We often have half a head of cabbage, just think I can make a quick slot of. We tend to buy a lot of cotija cheese and it really keeps well in the fridge. We always have red onions. I can make a quick pickled red onion. And from there, it's just, we'll often just take any vegetable we have. These are usually vegetable tacos more often. Um, sweet potatoes, cauliflower, broccoli, you can roast them in bits on a sheet pan with cumin, salt, pepper, garlic, whatever, just season it well. And then you bring it all together with hot sauce. Maybe we have sour cream or, but I feel like just that acidity from quick pickled onions, little crunch from cabbage, beans, it feels like a really nice combination. And it's very, it's easy. I mean, I, there is some chopping there, but it's easy. Like in the time the vegetables are roasting, you put everything else together. And then for us, these meals with the different components tend to work really well with our pickiest who might not eat the beans, but she might eat them avocado or the tortilla or the vegetables but like separately not together so more dishes but you know more people eating everything more buy-in from the consumers that's good we like that thank you and it's, it's such an inexpensive meal you know to turn like tortillas and a can of beans and a head of cauliflower into dinner for four people it's like always feels like a feat yeah. <laughs> Well, and this will be my last question before moving on to Q&A. You led us beautifully into this whole idea of economy in the kitchen. And Jacques, I know this is something we've talked about. All of you have actually, in your writing, spoken about this to a certain extent. Sometimes, um, okay, let's imagine everybody is going to go buy your books tonight and they're going to be so thrilled because on their doorstep is going to be a nice new stack of cookbooks. Nothing feels better. But they don't have every single ingredient in that recipe they want to make. Can you talk a little bit about how you find economy in your kitchen and is it okay to be flexible with the recipes? Jacques, I'm gonna lead off with you. Okay, well, yeah, of course 
it is. You know, people tell me uh, I don't know how to cook. So what do you think I should do? I say, what, do you have any friend who cook? I say, yes. I say, next time you go to your friend, say, can I come an hour ahead and uh, and cook with you? And, and say, you go. I say, bring a bottle of wine. So you bring a bottle of wine. You drink the bottle of wine. And by then, even if the chicken is overcooked, who cares? <laughs> you got to relax. <laughs> yeah, things are not. You know, uh, 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 I I I know that people will take your recipe and change it right away. For me, I think that each time you take a book, regardless of the book you take, if you do a recipe, you should do it exactly the way it is there. You know, I think the first time. So, and if you like it, then you're likely to do it again. So the second time you take a faster look too. By the third time you say, I think I'm gonna put more tomato in there or less of this, that too. And after six months, you've done it eight times, it becomes your recipe, you massage it enough so that it becomes yours, and that's your recipe, and you, you don't even remember where it comes from. This is a normal progression, I think, that it should be. But when people take a recipe that they've never done, change the whole thing to start with, and say it's much better, they don't know because they've never done <laughs> the recipe to start with, you know, so, so yes. Uh, so yeah, certainly uh, uh, you can, of course you can take liberty with recipe. I mean, for me, it's extremely difficult to follow a recipe, even mine. I do, <laughs> mine the books, I go, I say, why did I do that? So, so I do something else. So, so yeah. Thank you. All right, I see people are chomping at the bit to get their questions in. So mm -hmm. I am, right before we turn it over to the audience for questions, I do want to once again thank Darian Library. They are making four copies of the cookbooks available for a raffle, and I have some names mm -hmm. here. So for attendees, you are getting a free cookbook. So I'm going to read these names aloud, and then the library will contact you after tonight's event. So for <laughs> quick and simple, Andrew Farley, Congratulations. Good. Uh, a copy of Dinner in French is coming to Ryan Romanowski. There you go, Ryan. A Kid in the Kitchen is going to N Namita Jean. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. And Smitten Kitchen Every Day, Alex Ising, you're getting a copy of that. So congratulations and thanks again to the Darien Library. So I'm gonna go down to our questions here and I haven't looked at them yet. So if you give me a moment. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, first question. I want to know what everyone is eating tonight. We're having leftover chicken curry. Deb, Melissa, Jacques, what, what was on the dinner table for your families tonight? I had pasta vazoo. <laughs> pasta vazoo that I did, I, I did a, a new recipe for pasta vazoo. Because my daughter told me, could you do something simpler? I said, okay, fine. So I sauté some uh, some some onion, garlic. I put a can of tomato and a, a, a cup of uh, stock in it. And I put a handful of raw pasta in it to cook it. And it cooked in 15, 18 minutes. And I put a can of beans in it. So I did the pasta vazoo in about 30 minutes all together. So she said, I liked it. <laughs> it was good. Wonderful. Melissa, what about you? Um, tonight was one of those nights because I had this event where the three of us ate three totally separate things. Um, <laughs> my daughter ate leftover. I had made um, this in, in my cookbook dinner. I There's this sauteed sort of um, turkey based on a larb, like a Thai larb. So like sauteed turkey with um, fish sauce and garlic and, and cashews. Mm -hmm. So she ate the leftovers of that. Um, my husband, I, yesterday, actually, Jacques, I made something very similar. It was kind of a big pot of beans, mm -hmm. um, except um, more beans and rice, but the same, you know, just a can of beans and I, all kinds of things, pancetta, sauteed it all with some good broth. And he ate the leftovers of that. And I was craving um, jigai, you know, kimchi soup. So I had chopped up kimchi, simmered it in broth with um, some... Um, chili paste and um, tofu and I ate that. So three totally different meals. Um, but mine only took 10 minutes and the others were leftovers. This your husband is a lucky man then. <laughs> Deb, what's cooking in your house? Tonight? Or last, I know it's hard. You started this event at seven. You could say last night if you want. Uh, yes, I was gonna say, last night we had 
we had chicken. We actually made spaghetti and meatballs the day before. So that was, that's the perfect spaghetti and meatballs on the side. So I made that the day before. So we had leftovers last night, but tonight my husband's been wanting to order sushi for a while. So I said, go for it because I'm probably not going to make dinner tonight. So they're eating takeout sushi. However, I did just for the fun of it, make, um, David Leibovitz posted a new recipe this week for a French apple tart. And I love French apple tarts and I want to try all the recipes. Sorry, Melissa, I'm sure Jacques, you each have your own recipe, but I just, the last thing in front of my face <laughs> is the one I want to make. So I made that this afternoon. So they are, are also having a nice apple tart for dessert. Although mine doesn't look as beautiful as David's. Um, and I also think they're, my husband's going to make me a Manhattan. So. I'm excited about that. Is that dinner? No, Manhattan's not dinner, is it? Sorry. I, I, my husband's <laughs> going to make me a Manhattan after this, too. <laughs> well, that you. So I'm glad we're all Manhattan ladies. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, um, Wednesday. Okay. What is the day? <laughs> it's Wednesday. All right. The next big question is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving sides. We have someone. We have a lot of votes for this question. What is your favorite Thanksgiving go-to side? Jacques. My favorite what? Thanksgiving side. What are you having I, for Thanksgiving? I love Thanksgiving. You know, I never knew Thanksgiving before I came to America. And mm -hmm. uh, all of the holiday, or all of the special holiday, which is uh, the com commemoration of, uh, of some type of battle where thousands of people were dead and all that, or some type of uh, uh, religious uh, celebration. Uh, where you have to give gift and all that. Thanksgiving has nothing to do with that. You meet to eat and drink together. It is the greatest of all day. <laughs> I always mm -hmm. loved it from the beginning and so forth. And I, I do all kind of thing. I order a, a, of course, a turkey. I couldn't do it without. But one of the side dishes that I do, uh, the first time that I had sweet uh, uh, a pumpkin, pumpkin pie here, uh, I tested pumpkin pie and I said they put sugar in that thing. I said, what? <laughs> well, the pumpkin is right. it's a squash. You know, you use it as a zucchini or any type of squash. They put sugar in it. Now, I'm used to it. But at that point, we never did. So I have, in, I think I have in that book even, I do a gratin, a gratin of pumpkin. So I have a can of uh, pumpkin puree without it. But then in there, I put uh, salt, pepper, eggs, some gruyere and so forth to do a beautiful gratin. Takes a few minutes too, and it's quite good. Yeah. Thank you. Other side dish. Deb, what about you? Um, I love challah stuffing. I'm very loyal to stuffing. I know people put sausage in it, but I actually like it with just vegetables. Also, we have some vegetarians in the family, and there's never leftover. But if there is, um, my very favorite thing to do with it is to put it in a waffle iron the next morning. And make stuffing waffles and then you can put an egg on it because that's my that's like i'm not really that interested in the leftover turkey but i love that but i also i like there to be like one really kind of like over the top luxurious creamy rich i don't want multiple creamy dishes but i'm gonna do um a new a new recipe on the site the the leek and potato gratin this year also because i had to make a few to get the recipe right so my freezer is full of them <laughs> Um, and I love, I do like a good crunchy salad. I feel like salad's never the star of Thanksgiving, but I love, like, I need, I need a balance. I remember one year we did a Friendsgiving and I made a giant Caesar salad and it went first. People just like with all that rich food, all the cheese and the potatoes and the fried onions on top of the green beans, like a really, a crunchy salad really is a welcome reprieve on the plate. Thank you. Wonderful ideas. Melissa. Yeah, I know. I agree about the salad. I know this is controversial. In fact, um, my boss, Sam Sifton, says that salad has no place at Thanksgiving. And he and I disagree. We just have a disagreement about that. So I'm with you, Deb, on the salad. And we like to do like a, just a big, fresh, like, you know, Caesar sounds great. Or uh, we like, usually do an arugula salad. Um, mm. But one of my, but I I am also a stuffing person. I Because I don't eat enough stuffing. There's not enough stuffing in my life. I don't think of it except for Thanksgiving. And then I forget about it all year long. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, it's, it's stuffing time and I'm so happy. So I also do a very traditional um, stuffing. I also like it um, vegetarian with just, although I, I, put, I put chicken stock in it. So although you could use vegetable stock, but I like a lot of sauteed onions and leeks and um, 
and tons of herbs and butter on top and then you get it nice and crispy and you know I've, i'm going to try that waffle thing i've never done that but what i do is i do <laughs> similar i take the leftover stuffing i cut it into slices and then i fry it in butter so it's same too. kind of but it's, it's the same thing it's like that crispy buttery um but aside from those things we are we are definitely we we're a green bean family when it comes to thanksgiving we love mm -hmm. a snappy green bean like something you know and green beans right now are very mature you know it's the end of green bean season here so they're big and they're fat and they're like super crunchy and when you eat them they almost pop in your mouth like the you know the beans are inside mm -hmm. or like practically mature and so i love to do them with something like either ginger and garlic or anchovies and lots of lemon or preserved mm. lemon is really good preserved lemon and a little harissa, something super simple, just, you know, blanch them and then do a quick dressing, but something with a ton of flavor. Um, and I just mix it up, I kind of just wing it every year. I'll just do something, you know, as I go. And those are my favorites, like to have those side dishes to me, a salad, the green beans, and then the stuffing. And then yes, we do sweet potatoes with marshmallows because I have a kid, so, you know. <laughs> She would, have a kid. She, would, she would implode if I didn't. Like, what? <laughs> so the next very popular question is your favorite kitchen utensil, lightning round. <laughs> Who has a kitchen utensil that they can't live without? Microplane. My hand. <laughs> Small <laughs> offset spatula. I'm very strange. I use it so much. I, I, I'm up to four now and I feel like I'm just living in the lap of luxury. <laughs> They're like $3 each. <laughs> um, I use it so much. I, I use it to level things. I use it like my husband will be making the kids the aforementioned peanut butter and jelly. And I'm like, why are you using a knife? So much. It's like a spreader. It's so great. All right. We all have our things. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have some questions about what inspired each of you to get into the kitchen and cook. I'm seeing a lot of comments about how you all are big inspirations to this audience here, and they're curious to know who inspired you. Jacques, would you like to begin? Well, you know, as I said, I was born in a family of, my mother was the, was the chef in a little restaurant in France. But I have to say that there is 12, 12 restaurants in my family in France, 12 of them owned wow. by, by my two aunt, three aunt, cousin, mother to i was the first male to go into that business those were 12 women 12 formidable women i mean at some point i was the chef to the president in france and i remember coming back from paris going back to lyon and to nantua my my, my aunt at the restaurant in nantua i go into the kitchen cook with her she threw me out of the kitchen they used too much butter to <laughs> no one was impressed at all about the chef of the president so yeah the woman those formidable women of 12 different restaurants in my family, so. Thank you. Deb, what about you? Did, was there a particular inspiration behind your drive to get to the kitchen? I'm, I'm really picky. <laughs> I feel like I should have something more magnificent. After a story like that, you know, being like bratty child who didn't like anything. But um, I always, I don't, I know exactly the way I want things. And I, um, I want to make them that way. It's like maybe it's a control thing, but I um I really I really enjoy trying to figure out, especially if it's an ingredient that I think I'm not really crazy about. I love cooking with it. Like I love trying to figure out like how to like I don't know chicken breasts. Like the boneless ones have never been my favorite, but I've had so much fun over the years trying to come up with ways to make it like where I would choose to make it. Like I would choose this meal. So that's a lot of my cooking came from a place of I didn't think I liked this dish and now I do. So. Maybe not as special, but it's honest. Honest, for all that honesty. Melissa, what about you? Um, a person who's, you know, um, well, I mean, I can, you know, Julia Child and, and Jacques, you know, you were big um, for my parents. And so also to me, because, you know, I learned to cook from them and learned to cook from you. So that was very important. Right. But for me, one of the most important inspirations was MFK Fisher, um, because the mm -hmm. way, you know, I, I, she, I was like, oh, wait a second, I could, write about food and get paid for it. And I want to do that. And the way that she wrote a lot of her recipes, you know, the narrative form of writing a recipe and also Jane Grigson, who's a British food writer, yeah, yeah. does this too. And it's yeah. that narrative. It's, and each recipe becomes a story. And yeah. 
I am always inspired by that still. So those were big inspirations to me. You know, when I was just coming up, when I was in my 20s. Great. Wow. So it's very cold in our corner of the country today. As I mentioned, we have people joining from all across the United States and some internationally, but it was in the 20s in Connecticut anyway, when we woke wow. up this morning. And there's a question about soup. Favorite mm. soup? Perhaps a recipe you have in one of your books or something that you like to throw to wet together when the weather gets particularly cold. And I guess we could expand that question to casserole or anything warming at this time of year that you like. Well, should I stop? Yes, please. <laughs> my wife calls it my wife called it fridge soup. So I open the refrigerator and I have wilted lettuce. Half a carrot, a piece of onion. This that to all goes into the stock pot with chicken stock too, and I finish it with a handful of couscous or oatmeal even or pasta or anything like that. We do a soup in 10, 15 minutes, and certainly you're all very very young for me, but as you get older, mm -hmm. your metabolism change. And we I eat a lot of soup all the time. We do at home. So fridge soup is the good one for me also. Thank you, Deb. Yeah. I uh, I I would say my my for a cold day like today, like what I'm craving is I love making onion soup. I don't do it all the time, but I make it like once or twice a winter, and it always it feels perfect for right now where I'm still kind of craving that sort of luxurious thing. But um, my other favorite is I really love a simple vegetable soup, like a a cauliflower soup where you just I feel like what really makes a difference though is if you do eat meat, if you keep a homemade chicken stock in your freezer, like the bags, you know, in a quart bag or a good homemade vegetable stock, it makes a big difference. Like when you want to make a simple soup. And I also, I love doing um, like toppings. I love to add texture, but like on top. So maybe, maybe it'll, I'll, um, if I'm doing a potato soup, I might like, you know, fry up the skins just to make a little fun, crunchy topping or something fun like that, or just crumble in potato chips. Very wholesome. Potato chips, yum. Love that. Melissa, what about you? Well, first of all, I completely agree with what Deb just said about using homemade stock. Absolutely, you know, it just makes such a difference. And I love the fried po potato skins. Oh my God, what a good <laughs> idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. So yes, I agree about the texture too, like that textural contrast on top of a soup. Mm -hmm. You know, we eat a lot of soup also, and I also make a refrigerator soup kind of like yours, Jacques, I, except it's like pantry soup. It's like potato, it's all the root vegetables, you know, when you throw it in. And, but if you have good chicken stock and then a crunchy topping, it's amazing. But I'd probably, I'd say our go-to soup is lentil soup. We make, cause lentils mm. cook so quickly. We have a ton of them. I do the, I make a red lentil soup with lots of lemon. Um, the rest mm. is um, online at, at the end my tea cooking um but it's very basic it's like tomato paste cumin red lentils good good stock um and brown lentil soup too just because it's you know the whole thing is under 45 minutes and then it's it's just like very hearty and warming thank you so i'm seeing a lot of questions about pickiness deb you hit it you hit a pain point there <laughs> i have a couple one woman said i, I I want to know about my teenager who's still picky, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about a toddler. So anybody have good tips about kids who perhaps at the dinner <laughs> table are not interested in what's being put in front of them? Any experience? It looks like, Melissa, you have some experience there. <laughs> yeah, no, Dolly, our, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but Dolly, our kid is really picky. You know, she has a, she has like the texture thing. You know how some kids have the texture thing? So she won't eat things with a weird texture. She's 12. So I was like hoping by now maybe it would be, it's, it's getting a little better. Like for a while she wouldn't make sense. Like everything had to be separate. Um, so it's getting a little bit better, but she's always loved salad. It's funny. It's like, she's ever since she was a little kid. So mm -hmm. that was, I feel like as long as she eats salad, everything else, she can not eat every, she can just eat bread and butter and salad and it's fine. Um, so yeah, she's super picky. Um, uh, so for me, as what I, I'm just learning to say, you know what, that is who she is. And that's, I'm just trying to respect her pickiness. Just be like, she's eating, you know, as long as she, I know she's getting enough to eat, she's growing, she's fine. Um, and I try to limit the sweets, you know, try, but uh, you know, when they're at some point, you just have to give up control. You have to say they are different humans from us and it is okay. Um, and just I'll offer good food. And if she doesn't want to eat it, that is, it is okay. It is not a reflection on me, but that's really hard. I don't know. What do you guys have to say? Like I struggle with that mm -hmm. almost every single meal. Uh, 
Yeah, I have a, my daughter's, my son is actually, so he was our first and he is pretty cool with most food, which makes it a lot easier. So you're like, I've got this. I must be very good at this. I would tell you. And then we had the second child, the one that I always joke, I deserve. Like it's the one who eats nothing. She wants none of my cooking, but she also likes salad. So she has these like kind of random things that she really likes. And I'm like, okay, so maybe it's not a totally lost cause. For example, if we're chopping up cauliflower to make those tacos, she prefers it raw. So fine. Here's your bowl of raw cauliflower <laughs> and the plain noodles. She actually actually asked for pasta with nothing on it and nothing near it because she knows I'm always going to try something. I'm always going to try to sneak something into it. Um, but I try to remember, like I just said, I'm a picky person. So and look what I eat now. So I think that um, I think with kids, I, I, she's probably going to grow out of it. I've grown out of most of I mean, the things that I wouldn't eat uh, most. <laughs> And I also think I have a theory that kids can be a little pickier at home than they'd be at a friend's house, like at a friend or like I always think of like the French kids in their school cafeteria where they served like veal or a soup or whatever. Like I just think like if she was among her friends being served food that challenged her, she might go with the flow more than she does at home when it's like, mom, you know, I don't like anything on my noodles. So um, I think there's a lot. There's a lot there. Well, I remember it's a long time ago when Claudine was small. I realized at some point we never discussed the menu. We put that there and we have string beans or whatever. And then she loves string beans. And for three weeks later, she hates string beans. And wow. then, uh, but we never discussed it. We never, the worst thing is to do is to go on your knees because the kid is eating Brussels sprouts or spinach or whatever. No, we put it there. We eat it, they love it, then they don't love it anymore, then they love it again, and did that too. Let it go, as it goes, this is basically what we did, and, uh, and uh, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, that's the way the kids are, so, yeah. Yeah. Play with it. And you don't want mealtime to be a battleground. You don't want the table to be like people bickering and arguing over like it's just then. I mean, that's all of us who love food and love to cook. Like we want dinner to be this really great reprieve at the end of the day and not a time where we lecture people about not eating whatever. So I'm not saying we do this perfectly, but that's the goal. Agreed. I feel like my kids are listening outside the door. too. <laughs> Shall we bring them in for a moment? No. Just <laughs> So the last and um, perhaps the most popular question is for Jacques, and everyone is dying to know what red you are drinking. Mm. <laughs> Free wine. Someone Free brought wine. a glass of wine. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a Côte du Rhône. It. it's a Côte du Rhône. It's a Côte du Rhône wine. Uh, no. no, not really. This one is a Bordeaux. It's a, it's a, it's a Petit Bordeaux uh, wine, which is, uh, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon, so far, so fine. But whatever. I mean, I am probably, uh, I love uh, wine, ordinary wine. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love great wine occasionally, but uh, I have been to so many places where they get you extraordinary wine. They give you that much and you have to smell it and analyze it. No, 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 no. I need a glass of wine, two glasses of wine. And... Uh, Good, simple wine is what I go for, and a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, many, many, many thanks to all three of you for taking time out this evening. This was a real treat. We could go on and on. So many questions. Mm -hmm. I said to say you are beloved by this community here, and we are so grateful to you and also to the Darien Library, again, for your ongoing partnership. And to all of you who came out tonight, uh, even if you're only in your own homes, we really appreciate you showing up. All the books are available for purchase on our website, Thank and you. we hope you support the chefs and their work. Thank you, and good night. Thank you all for coming, and happy cooking. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>